there and welcome to Shots in the Quark. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at one of the most important principles in modern theoretical physics, the least action principle. This is an entirely different way of doing physics, which, if you've never encountered before, may seem a little strange. In high school physics, you become familiar with Newtonian mechanics, where your fundamental kinds of entity are space, time, objects, and forces. Given a set of forces acting on an object, Newton's laws of motion tell you how that object will move through space over time. Now, if we forget about Newtonian mechanics and instead use this principle of least action that I've mentioned, then we end up doing something called Lagrangian mechanics. It turns out that Lagrangian mechanics is far more general than Newtonian mechanics and can be used to study all kinds of systems, including Newtonian, relativistic, and even quantum systems. This is why understanding the least action principle and Lagrangian mechanics is so important in contemporary physics. It's essentially the single framework in which all of our current physical theories are written. Okay, so what is the least action principle and why is it so powerful? To understand, we're going to look at a classic problem in optics. I'm sure you've already heard of a rather handy rule known as Snell's law, which tells us how light is refracted when it travels from one medium to another. Let's suppose that we shine a ray of light at a glass block. Upon hitting the boundary between the air and the glass, the light ray is refracted, meaning it changes direction. Now, the air and the glass are each characterized by a certain number called their refractive index, which is essentially a measure of how fast light travels through that substance. The slower light travels through a substance, the higher its refractive index. Light travels faster in air than it does in glass, and so air has a refractive index of about 1, whereas glass has a refractive index of about 1.5. Now what Snell's law tells us is this. The refractive index of the first medium times the sine of the angle of incidence, which is the angle between the light ray and the perpendicular to the boundary, is equal to the refractive index of the second medium times the sine of the angle of refraction, which is the angle between the light ray after it's refracted and the perpendicular to the boundary. This law was originally derived empirically, simply by measuring the angle of incidence and angle of refraction in different setups and finding a mathematical relationship that accurately described what was seen in experiments. It wasn't until the 17th century that theoretical arguments involving physical concepts were used to actually prove this relationship. Now, there are several different ways that you can prove Snell's law. You can use energy and momentum conservation, or you can use Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. The way that we'll be concerned with, however, which is perhaps the most striking one, uses a principle introduced by the legendary mathematician Pierre de Fermat. Let's suppose that we have a very similar setup to before. We have a light source at the point A and a boundary between two different media, air and glass. Let's also suppose that we want our light ray to end up traveling through the point B in the glass. Given these fixed start and end points, the only thing that we can actually vary here will be the orientation of the light source, or in other words, which point along the boundary the light ray is going to enter the glass. An interesting question to ask is where we should put this point along the boundary such that we minimize the total time that it takes for the light ray to travel from A to B. The answer to this is not immediately obvious since it involves a trade-off between two competing effects. Glass has a larger refractive index than air, and so light travels slower in glass than it does in air. Since light travels slower in glass, we don't want to spend too much of our journey traveling through the glass. A straight line between A and B will be the shortest possible path for the light to travel. But a lot of this path is needlessly through the slow glass. 
We could reduce the total time if we travelled a larger total distance, but spent more of it in the air. What about if we spent the least possible time in the slower medium? Well, this may mean that we're spending less time going through the slow zone, but the total distance for the journey has now increased. The fastest path possible, in fact, is one between these two, where the compromise between total distance and time spent in the slower medium is optimal. So what is this optimal path? Well, it just so happens that the quickest path from A to B is the one that obeys Snell's law. In other words, light rays always seem to take the fastest possible route between two points. This is the principle I mentioned earlier, the one introduced by Fermat, and is known as Fermat's least time principle. If we reverse the order of the logic here, and assume the least time principle, that light always takes the quickest path between two points, then we can derive Snell's law as a consequence. Now you may have noticed something quite strange about the least time principle. There seems to be some suggestion here that the light ray already knows where it's going to end up before it gets there. After all, in order to work out the quickest path between A and B, you need to know where B is first. So how can light travel along the quickest path before it's actually ended up at the end point B? Does light know already where it's going to end up before it gets there? The answer to this question relies on the fact that light has wave-like properties. A wave doesn't just travel along one path, it sweeps out all possible paths which then interfere constructively and destructively. Unfortunately, that explanation will have to do for now. A much more full and interesting explanation can be given in terms of something called a path integral, but that is a subject for another time. What we've learned so far is that light is lazy. It always travels along the path that takes the least amount of time. More profoundly, if we assume Fermat's least time principle, then we can derive a lot about the way that light behaves, including, as we've seen, Snell's law. Now the question we want to ask is whether there is a similar principle that we can apply to more than just light rays. It turns out there is. In general, physical systems obey what's called the least action principle, which states that systems will evolve in such a way that minimizes the total action. This is a lot like the least time principle, which says that light evolves in such a way that minimizes the total journey time. But now, instead of minimizing time, we're minimizing this thing called action. But what is action? Action is a bit of a strange quantity. It's not something you will have encountered in Newtonian physics. It has units of energy times time and is given here by the integral of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy with respect to time. To get a better grasp of what action is, let's consider a specific system. Let's suppose we just have a single particle of mass m in a gravitational field with gravitational field strength G. This means that the kinetic energy of the particle will be given by half m x dot squared, where m is the mass and x dot is its velocity, and its potential energy v will be given by mgx, where x is the height of the particle. In this case, our action s will be the integral of the kinetic energy half m x dot squared minus the potential energy mgx with respect to time. We call this combination of energies L, and it is a function of the particle's position and velocity. This function L is what we call the Lagrangian, and we'll see that it has a special significance. Now what we're claiming here is that nature obeys a least action principle. That is to say that all physical systems will evolve in such a way as to minimize the total action. So how must a system behave in order to do this? Well, the action is minimized when this special function, the Lagrangian, satisfies an equation known as the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, I don't want to go into the details of how this equation is actually derived. All we need to know for now is that if the least action principle is the case, 
then physical systems will obey the Euler-Lagrange equation. So for our system, which is a single particle in a gravitational field, what do the Euler-Lagrange equations look like? Well, our Lagrangian is a half m x dot squared minus m g x. The derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to velocity is given by m x dot. Differentiating this with respect to time, we get m x double dot, which is the mass times the acceleration. The derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x is minus mg. Putting this all together, we get our Euler-Lagrange equation for this system. And we find something quite remarkable. We find that the action is minimized when the mass times the acceleration of our particle is equal to the gravitational force, the weight of that particle. This is just Newton's second law for the gravitational force. What's remarkable about this is that we've just shown that Newton's second law of motion can be seen as a consequence of the least action principle applied to this system. At high school, you'll have been taught Newton's laws as if they were axioms or assumptions. But what we've just seen is that Newton's laws of motion can be derived from a single, more fundamental principle. If we merely assume that physical systems are lazy and minimize their total action, then we get the equations of motion for that system for free. This way of doing mechanics is called Lagrangian mechanics. Take any system, write down its Lagrangian, work out the Euler-Lagrange equation, and you get the equations of motion, the laws that that system will obey. It usually won't be until a university physics course when you'll see Lagrangian mechanics for the first time. And even then, you're unlikely to be told the true importance of this framework. Lagrangian mechanics at university is usually taught as a reformulation of mechanics that will allow you to solve for the behavior of very complicated systems like pendular moving on carts in a much more simple way than applying Newton's laws directly. But this is not why Lagrangian mechanics is so important. Its importance lies in how universally it can be applied. It is far better than just a different way of doing mechanics. Lagrangian mechanics is how we study all sorts of systems, relativistic ones, condensed matter ones, or even quantum ones. Take any system, write down its Lagrangian, and then you can work out its equations of motion from the Euler-Lagrange equation. Here's a few examples. This is the Lagrangian for a particle in the vicinity of a black hole. This is the Lagrangian for electromagnetism. And this is the Lagrangian for a scalar particle in quantum field theory. This is actually the Lagrangian I usually work from. It's for the scalar field responsible for inflation, the inflaton, but including some weak effects of gravity. This then is the single framework we use for almost all modern theoretical physics. To study any system, we write down its Lagrangian and apply the least action principle. At this point, we should pause and think about what this all means. We started out by talking about how light is refracted by a change in medium. We showed that the law of refraction could be derived from a single principle, that light always travels along the quickest path between two points. But this is a principle that only works for light. Most other physical systems will not just take the quickest path between two endpoints. If this were all there was to it, the least time principle would seem a bit mysterious, but maybe not all that profound. What we've seen, however, is that there is a principle that applies not just to light, but to all physical systems. That is the least action principle. Take any system, apply the least action principle, and you'll get that system's equations of motion. That is amazing. It's as if all of physics were the consequence of just this single principle. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe for more Shots in the Quark. Thank <laughs> you.